A shortage of workers in the U.S. has proven at least one thing. It's good to be a robot. North American companies last year, faced with a tight labor market, brought on a record number of robots in 2022. That's according to data compiled by the Association for Advancing Automation, an industry group also known as A3, which said that over 44,000 robots were ordered in 2022, an 11% increase over the previous year, and a new record. Most of them will be put to use at U.S. factories, with some in Canada and Mexico. More than half of last year's orders came from automakers and their suppliers, a group that has long led the way in automation of U.S. factories. New plants for electric vehicles, batteries, and battery recycling have been announced since the beginning of 2021 at a cost of $160 billion, according to Atlas Public Policy, a U.S.-based research group. Most robots ordered last year will be used for material handling, an expansive category that includes all types of movement and handling of goods inside factories and warehouses. But industry group A3 said there was a visible slowdown in robot orders at the end of the year, which raises a question about how 2023 will evolve. Supply chain problems may also have distorted last year's results. A3 said robot makers saw some customers place extra orders during the health crisis just to ensure they would get part of what they needed. Or, as one executive told Reuters, quote, we couldn't get a $15 an hour guy to show up. Uh, Thank you. To start, uh, give us your definition of the neobiological revolution. So I consider the neobiological revolution essentially the next phase of the digital revolution. When we take all of our fancy digital tools and godlike technologies to engineer human biology, basically to transform our own species. What are you most excited about? Well, this is like asking me, which one of my babies do I love most? <laughs> there, uh, well, okay, sure, which one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I fall in love with technology. I get very excited about this stuff. And I'm very excited about using technology to transform health and solve some of the problems that have plagued us for, for um, millennia. Um, of course, the mRNA platform is astonishing. And um, using that not only to create the COVID vaccine, um, but to do all kinds of treatments um, in a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost, that's incredibly exciting. Um, you know, it's essentially biological software that can be used even beyond its therapeutic um, potential. So we're going to see a lot of creative ways um, that mRNA can be used. As USAID Administrator, I have the chance to travel all around the world to engage with people who are working every day to strengthen democratic institutions, to build independent media, and to promote and protect human rights. I'm here in Hungary, one of the countries in Central Europe where USAID has recently relaunched programming to tackle just these challenges. I'm gonna spend the next couple days engaging with Hungarians about their vision for a brighter future. Interesting. This is kind of unusual that these pilots saw different things, and that is sort of, I guess, adding to the mystery of all this. Yeah, not even the pilots apparently were really able to identify what they saw. And just to take you back for a sec, on Thursday, the uh, the U.S. defense officials sent F-35 fighter jets up to try to figure out what this object was that was flying around near Alaska. Those pilots, we have learned, have given very conflicting accounts of what they actually experienced, with some pilots saying that the, the object interfered with the plane's sensors, other pilots saying that they didn't really experience that, other pilots saying that when they looked at the object, they could identify no identifiable uh, identifiable propulsion system, and they did not know how it was actually staying in the air, cruising at that altitude of about 40,000 feet. So this has all added to the Pentagon's wariness of describing in more detail what this object actually is until they can get more information uh, through the debris that they are recovering right now. We are at the beginning, when you look at it, at technology transformation, it usually takes place in, in the terms of an S-curve. And we are just now where we move into the exponential phase. And I agree, artificial intelligence, but not only artificial intelligence, <clears throat> but also the metaverse, new space technologies, 
and I could go on and on, synthetic biology. Our life in 10 years from now will be completely different, very much affected, and who masters those technologies in some way will be the master of the world. It may look like these people are playing video games, but they're actually taking a psychometric test. The immersive virtual reality platform combines artificial intelligence and psychometric testing and invites employees to step into the metaverse to face various workplace scenarios. You could also report someone for no reason, if you wish. London-based company Jensen 8 says the use of AI helps reveal patterns in individuals' behaviours and team dynamics, while eliminating human bias. Things like how uh, conscientious someone is, how productive they tend to be, how agreeable they are, how much they trust other people. So, how does it work? The Jensen 8 platform transports up to 20 co-workers into a VR scenario. Jenna Davidson, CEO of Jensen 8, says employees are then confronted with collaborative group exercises. So it's about being able to bring groups of people together in a cloud-enabled way where the VR is used to change the environment, to dial up the pressure, to change the, the problem solving. It's about how people interact and using VR as that environment. How do you get up to the escape pod? The scenarios all take place in futuristic settings, like this one on a Martian base. Good afternoon, Team Apollo. This uh, is your mission uh, commander. Like it's like a little tablet that'll be behind you. So if you create environments that are too similar, what happens is our, our minds go, hang on, that's not real, and we then break presence. What we're looking for is authentic behavior. So what the, the one that's behind here, who's been to space? Well, maybe a few people. So. Why is, why is the American military shooting something out of the sky over Canada? Because it's part of a NORAD. There is a, the NORAD okay. is part of like a, it, part of a, it, it's a, it's a, what you call a coalition, a consortium, a consortium. A, a pact so, of nations. A pact, okay. exactly. And so that's why we were able to do that. Again, it, we didn't do it on our own. We did right. it in, in, uh, in, uh, clearly in, 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 in step with uh, right. Canada. Canada. Uh, 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 Heads up for middle school parents, incoming 7th graders will be required to get another vaccine next school year. Now the Wisconsin Department of Health Services says the meningitis vaccine will also be required. Meningitis is an infection that covers the brain and it can quickly turn fatal if left untreated. One Gunderson Health System doctor says in some cases the vaccine can be administered, administered even earlier. We do it at 11 to 12 years of age, unless there are additional risk factors. And we do have some special circumstances um, for which we vaccinate with meningococcal vaccine at earlier ages. Doctors say if you have any questions about the meningitis vaccine to contact your child's pediatrician. First of all, we're working together and we, and we want to make these programs work together. Uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is the largest and most significant piece of clean energy legislation, most significant climate legislation that's ever passed uh, in U.S. history. And uh, it's uh, 370, estimated to be about $370 billion over 10 years. It's uh, transformative uh, and attacking all the sectors of the economy that are involved in, in, uh, in emissions. Uh, causing climate change, clean power, clean buildings, clean transportation, clean manufacturing. We've seen a renaissance in manufacturing already as a result of uh, the anticipation. Once that bill passed, people are coming forward, uh, built on top of the infrastructure uh, funds that are that that you know Mitch has been talking about. There's been over 200 billion dollars of announced investment in. Uh, electric vehicle batteries alone, and these investments are taking place all across the country, uh, from Georgia and Alabama to Michigan and Ohio to uh, upstate New York to California and Nevada. There, it, this is really significant and transformative, and I think will reach every corner of the United States. 
one thing I should say, on, and I know this is called the World Government Summit, um, but um, I think we should be maybe a little bit concerned about uh, actually becoming too much of a single world government. Um, if, if I may say that we want to avoid creating a civilizational risk by having, um, frankly, this may sound a little odd, too much cooperation between governments. Um, you know, if you know, if you look at say the, at history and the rise and fall of civilizations, um, the, the really all throughout history civilizations have risen and fallen. But it hasn't meant the doom of humanity as a whole because there've been there've been all these separate civilizations that were separated by great distances. And so, um, you know, say like while Rome was falling, it, uh, it you know. Uh, Islam was rising, and uh, so you had like a, uh, you know, the, the sort of caliphate do, doing incredibly well while Rome was doing terribly. Um, and that actually ended up being a source of preservation of knowledge uh, and, uh, and many uh, scientific advancements. And so, um, so I think we want to be a little bit cautious about uh, being too much of a world, of a single uh, civilization because if we are too much of a single civilization then if, if we if the whole the whole thing may collapse um i'm not, obviously not suggesting war or anything like that but i think we want to be a little bit wary of actually cooperating too much it sounds a little odd but um but we, we just we, we want to have some amount of civilizational diversity such that if uh, if something does go wrong with some part of civilization that the whole thing doesn't collapse uh, and, 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 you know, humanity keeps moving forward. We're not yet at the point where what all of you are thinking right now is something that like a little thought bubble above your head is something we can see, but we're getting there. Which means that the NSA and other organizations <laughs> can spy not just on your email and your cell phones, but soon potentially on your brains as well. I do believe it's Norfolk Southern. Do you think that they're the best people to carry out those tests? No. Why? No, because they can rig those machines to say whatever they want them to say to give everybody a false sense of security when in the in the same sense you know we don't know we don't know what's in the air we don't know what's in our homes well there's a few things for you first of all governor dewine is exactly right this train was not labeled as high hazardous we're looking into why that was that's likely a screw up on the department of transportation side and we're trying to investigate that as we speak uh, the second thing, the thing that we're most focused on right now, Maria, is the quality of the air and water, especially the water. Uh, we're encouraging everybody to get their ground wells tested. There are a lot of private wells in this area, and we want to make sure that the water is safe to drink. The EPA, we've been really hammering them on what the acceptable safety levels are uh, for the drinking water in East Palestine. We've yet to get the answers that we want, and so we're c continuing to follow up on that. Uh, and then there's, there's the third element of this, Maria, is why did this happen? in the first place. Why wasn't the train labeled as high hazardous? That means that a lot of people didn't know what was on the train in the first place. Why have we gotten into a position where we're having hundreds of train derailments every year in this country when we just spent a trillion dollars on infrastructure? This stuff should be becoming less likely, uh, not happening as frequently as it is. So there's, there's a lot of issues here, but right now my main focus is the health and safety of the groundwater in East Palestine. Yeah. First, we are deeply troubled by Israel's announcement that it will reportedly advance thousands of settlements and begin a process to retroactively legalize nine outposts in the West Bank that were previously illegal under Israeli law. Like previous administrations, we strongly oppose these unilateral measures, which exacerbate tensions, harm trust between the parties, and undermine the prospects for a negotiated two-state solution. During his recent trip to Israel, Secretary Blinken was clear that all parties should refrain from actions that heighten tensions and take us further away from peace. Israel's decision on settlements and outposts runs directly contrary to those objectives. 
As Secretary Blinken has said, anything that takes us away from the vision of two states for two peoples is detrimental to Israel's long-term security, its identity as a Jewish and democratic state, and to our vision of equal measures of security, freedom, prosperity, and dignity for Israelis and Palestinians alike. We call on all parties to avoid additional actions that can further escalate tensions in the region and to take practical steps that can improve the well-being of the Palestinian people. To look at this and say the reason that the Russian army is on NATO, uh, the, the Russian army is at NATO's doorstep is because NATO has expanded rather than the, the Russians expanding. That, in other words, NATO has moved closer to Russia rather than Russia moving closer to NATO. Is that not an accurate way to look at this? I think that's the way President Putin probably looks at it. It's certainly not but the way that we look at it. You don't you don't think that NATO has expanded eastward toward Russia? NATO has expanded, okay. and, and the expansion so the has reason, been a good thing for... So the reason that the Russian army is at NATO's doorstep is not the fault of the Russian army, not the... It's not the Russian army that's done it. It's NATO has moved closer to move east. I'm pretty east. sure it wasn't NATO who was ordering, you know, upwards of 15 battalion tactical groups to within 10 kilometers of the border with Ukraine. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't NATO who put little green men inside Ukraine to destabilize okay. eastern well, I'm states. I'm pretty sure that Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So unless that's changed... It's not, it's not okay. changed, but I'm so, pretty sure the movement by Russia is has Russia's NATO, has, If NATO has moved east... The reason that the Russian army is closer or on NATO's doorstep is because NATO moved. Not NATO is not an, an anti-Russia alliance. NATO is a security alliance. For, for 50 years, it was an anti-Soviet alliance. So do you, not understand it, so do you not understand how or can you not even see how the Russians would perceive it as a, as a threat? And the fact that it keeps getting closer to their border while their troops... I mean, the, the places where their troops are, you say their troops are, and may, may have been in Ukraine and Georgia, are not NATO members. I don't have, I'm not going to pretend to know what goes in President Putin's mind or Russian military commanders. I mean, okay. I barely got a history degree at the University of South Florida. Right. What, I can tell you, what I can tell you is that, is that uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. It remains a defensive alliance. Fair enough, but it has moved east. Correct? I mean, that's just a it fact. It has expanded, absolutely. Right, exactly. But it's there's no reason, reason for anybody to think the expansion is a hostile or threatening move. We're and talking. we've been saying that throughout the last 15 We're years, man. Like you're, you're, mo you're moving closer to Russia. You're blaming the Russians for being close to NATO. No, no, no. no. That's <laughs> exactly what Hegel said. We're blaming like. the Russians for violating the territorial integrity of Ukraine and destabilizing okay. the security situation. Which is situation not a NATO Europe. member. Which is not a NATO member. I, I, I see Other you countries feel threatened. Yeah. We know where Caitlin Schwarzwalder is tonight. She's right outside the town hall where no officials from the Biden administration or the train company bothered to show up. She's the owner of the Von Schwartz Doberman Kennel in Pennsylvania. She's a dog person. She lives about a mile over the border from East Palestine. And she has just been asked to sign a waiver promising not to sue agencies monitoring the air near her property. We thought that was telling. Caitlin Schwarzwalder joins us tonight with her boyfriend, Chris Wells. Caitlin and Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kelly, if you'll just explain your experience with the official who asked you to sign a waiver. Sure. So what I can tell you is that um, we would like to have independent testing done. And um, uh, the, the people at Norfolk had suggested that they were going to offer services by an independent testing company to do uh, air and water testing for us. Um, when these people came to our property, uh, the company was called CTEH. Uh, I call it CTEC, and um, they had approached our property, came to our, our driveway and said, you know, we're here to test the water and soil. And I said, okay, so you guys are independent from Norfolk. And they said, well, not exactly. So then they handed us a contract. Um, the contract stated that essentially uh, Norfolk or any of its affiliates, you know, were going to be, uh, you know, encroaching on the property. They were going to be doing the testing. Um, and that it was essentially a hold harmless agreement. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but what I can tell you is that uh, I did not want to risk um, anything for my future, the future of the business, uh, by signing this contract. Uh, EPA was also there, um, and we had asked, uh, Chris specifically had asked EPA if they could come in by themselves or without signing of any agreements, and they denied that. Well, yeah, I mean, having the company whose train derailed test for the effects of the derailment is a little like putting Pfizer in charge of the FDA. Oh, I guess we did that. How 
how is this transition going to happen? I mean, I, I agree, totally agree that the world order, the way it is built today, doesn't make any sense. That is, it's not in line with the economic powers like India, Brazil, or Germany, you know, that they don't have a, they don't have a, a massive role in the, in the international order. But to me, the big question is, so how we are going to go through this transform? It has to be, it cannot be gradual. It has to be, has to be driven by a, part, for, by a certain shock that will happen. So now we will reconsider this entire... No, so if your question is mm -hmm. that this period could be turbulent, could have violence, yes. could have conflicts, we are already living it. Yeah. I think the last, the last five or six years tell us that we are going through a rather turbulent phase. Mm -hmm. We have lost a large part of humankind to the pandemic because we were all selfish, we, did, we were not willing to share, we were not willing to cre use the global institutions to deliver uh, responses to different parts of the world. We have lost people. Now, how much more bloodshed do we need to understand that the, the transition is upon us? You have to go beyond mainstream media to get your information these days. You cannot rely. The, the, the biggest problem I have with people that are former colleagues that won't talk to me anymore <laughs> It's because they get all their information from the New York Times. They believe it. It's all true. If it's there, it's got to be true. Well, maybe uh, it was half true 20 years ago, but, you know, it's, and of course, it's not all untrue. But, you know, the, the problem is they, they, they deliberately create these false narratives that are really like very sophisticated psyops. And if you have enough of those in your head, you have your worldview is so skewed that you have, really have no idea what's going on. So that's why. Shows like yours are really important, even if they get banned from YouTube or whatever. You know, PayPal won't help you anymore, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, is, that, is that reflective of a free and democratic society? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I've had that same experience. I mean, I used to teach at the top school here in, in Mexico. Uh, by the one, but by the way, the only university uh, in all of Latin America officially invited to the World Economic uh, Forum mo most recently, but. Um, and I've had the same approach with people in, you know, people that I knew in that area, in the academia oh. university, and they, they just, fin they, they live in a completely alternate reality. And what you mentioned about PayPal, I mean, I mean, like, I still can't believe that less than a year ago, the Department of Homeland Security banned me from PayPal, which means that I am having just little old me, I'm, I'm having oh. enough of an effect that I'm deemed, uh, you know, sh shut off the spigots to this guy, which is pretty crazy, but, um, <laughs> Any any then uh, final thought? Uh, the fact that the Department of Homeland Security can dictate what PayPal does tells you a lot about what's going on. You know, these are not free, independent corporate entities that are working to distribute information to educate and inform the American and the world public. Are <laughs> far from it. If you look what's happening in Germany, they, they it's a three year you know the Alina Lip. I mean, they what did they censor her to three years in prison for even reporting what was happening in Donbass? Well, they shut up her account. Legal, and her, 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 her parents' <laughs> account. They they shut off Alina Lip's parents' bank accounts. So oh. It has nothing to do with anything. If you need a single location to get cutting edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.